can you turn your industrial equipment program into a profit center instead of simply costing you money? How can you keep your equipment running longer even when you put it through the ringer? We will deal with these questions and much, much more on each episode of Maintenance Shop Talk, a podcast presented by ExxonMobil. I'm your host, Michelle Segrist, and today we'll be talking about every industrial company's favorite topic, energy efficiency. Joining us once again today are Michelle Ruiz, a lubrication engineer with ExxonMobil, who's helped develop energy efficiency benchmarks, and Ken Bannister, an engineering consultant and published author on industrial maintenance. So Ken and Michelle, welcome back. Thanks for having us back. Thanks, Michelle. Wonderful to have you again. So let's just jump right in. A lot of people define the term energy efficiency differently. So I'm really interested to know how we should be thinking about energy efficiency. Sure. Well, the way that I think we should start thinking about energy efficiency is as an untapped opportunity for making more profit. You know, when you are not spending all of your money on energy, then that's more money improving your bottom line. But it's not only like it really helps you financially, right? I think it's also something we should be thinking out in terms of how it can affect your corporate image and how it can affect your corporate and community relations. You know, people usually start thinking about residential appliances or like fuel efficiency, business lighting, stuff like that when they talk about energy efficiency. But again, that untapped opportunity is saying, where else can we make more money? Where else can we find more savings? That's a great point. So Ken, what can you add to that? Sure, energy efficiency is basically a coat of many colors. Michelle was talking about sustainability And if you have a program in your company, you may not have specifically an energy savings initiative, but if you do have something like a sustainability program, it may be called a waste elimination, a conservation program, or even a green initiative. Any of those will for sure have a major component in it, which drives that energy efficiency. So you should look towards those in in that regard. And when we're talking about the energy efficiency, most people think at this point, oh, electrical savings, automatically uh, we tend to go to that aspect of it. But let's not forget about gasoline savings. If you're a dispatched type of corporation, there's a lot of driving, or you have multiple facilities, a lot of movement between the facilities. Power is used through gasoline and more efficient way of using your fuel and your movement back and forth is reducing waste, but also reducing energy in that regard. Natural gas, fuel oils, all of those combined together for heating and for furnaces, those kind of elements there uh, in the corporation. You need to look at those aspects because that's also energy efficiency and as well as the good old electricity as well. So uh, energy efficiency is all around us in many different ways. Okay. So now that we sort of have an idea of how we should be thinking about energy efficiency, I want to dive in a little deeper. Let's say that I'm an industrial operator and I want to reduce my overall energy consumption. Michelle, where do I start? So let's take it from the step of being a corporate operator first rather than a machine operator. So from a corporate perspective, you can start looking at your state programs. There is a database called the DESIRE, D-S-I-R-E database that basically tells you what state programs are available. For example, here in Wisconsin, We work really closely with the Focus on Energy program. They essentially give incentive money to businesses that are willing to invest in energy efficient technology. And usually the easy go to's are people fixing their lights, patching up compressor leaks, things that are kind of high ticket items. But then more recently, you know, when you're taking an innovative approach at figuring out like how else can we reduce energy, these programs are also looking at lubricant. So really looking at how else can we find better savings from energy. So definitely look at those state programs, in my opinion. Well, I'll take it from the perspective of, say, a a machine operator. So the hands-on guy and the maintenance crews and the reliability crews really have to listen to the operator because they understand when a machine is in what we call the sweet spot when it's running bang on as it should be. And as soon as anything changes, the operator feels it and hears it and sees it often. So all the senses are at play. And we need to capitalize on that when talking that same language with the operator. So for instance, if there's excessive vibration, it usually means that friction will be caused, which will cause heat, which will cause excess energy. For instance, if things are not aligned correctly, the same thing will happen as well. And often we blame 
a bearing failure on poor lubrication when it's ineffective alignment that's actually caused it and the poor lubricant had nothing to do with it at all. But those are the kind of things that we're looking for from a machine operator. The lubricant itself in the reservoirs, is it between the high and the low level? Has not been overfilled or underfilled? So there's lots of things we can do practically to work with the machine operator to understand when the machine is not on the sweet spot. Yeah, Ken, those are some great examples. And that's a perfect segue into a conversation about what are some of the common culprits in a plant? I mean, you mentioned a few of them. What do you think they are, Michelle? If I start from an equipment standpoint, my go-to would be to say compressors, hydraulics, and worm gears. Mm -hmm. Compressors leak. Leaks cost a ton of money. I think the figure is compressors account for $3.2 billion in wasted energy costs annually in the United States. Without a leak management strategy, you can lose between 30 to 50% of your compressed air just with leaks. So that's a big one in terms of expenses and energy draw. The second one is hydraulics. Hydraulics varnish through oxidation. There are deposits that slow down your machinery. So definitely something to look out for, like similar to that previous question in terms of your energy consumption, that pulls up your energy consumption quite a bit. And then the last one is worm gears. Worm gears just normally by design are meant to slide a lot. And sliding is a lot of friction and friction means lost energy. So those would be my three go-to common culprits in a plant. I'll just capitalize on what Michelle was saying with compressors there. I mean, of a number of studies that I've been involved with, with power operators and energy companies, we found that utilizing the correct lubricant, for instance, going from a mineral base to a synthetic base, specifically on reciprocating compressors, we can get a 3 to 4% energy reduction. On centrifugals, on very large centrifugals, we can get a 1% reduction. And when we're talking very large compressors, we're talking about savings in the eight to ten to fifteen thousand dollar range per annum. So it all adds up significantly in that regard. And even just setting up an automated lubrication system correctly. For instance, I did some work on tuning up a straight side press, a 500 ton straight side press with a box cam lubricator on board. It was a minster press with a proprietary lubrication system. And just by setting that up correctly in all of the bearings, there's a lot of sliding friction going on there, as Michelle was talking about, on the slides. We gained an 18%, an unbelievable amount of energy uh, reduction in that term of utilizing one press alone. And they had 30 presses in the corporation, so they loved the energy efficiency that they gained from that setup. That's awesome. How could you not love that kind of savings? (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) In terms of resources, though, like this is kind of where you can go back to those kind of programs that provide you free advisors to help you figure out like, where can I find areas of opportunity with compressors or with any other piece of equipment? There is always a place for improvement in each piece of equipment, in my opinion. Yeah, that Mm -hmm. brings up a really interesting question. This is a lot of data that you're throwing out there and a lot of impressive numbers, but how do you actually understand what your current energy consumption is? How can I understand that as an operator and how can a plant understand that? Well, I'll take that one, Michelle, in terms of we have to focus, right? So first of all, we have to understand our energy bill and how much energy we are actually using and how that's broken down. Is it broken down by the plant? Is it broken down by each production line? by area, or by individual machine. And once you have that, you then understand where you can start to make the changes to show and prove that you're actually gaining energy efficiency through the programs and initiatives that you're actually performing, like we've spoken about. So the basic there is to isolate Mm -hmm. and gain focus in terms of where the power is and understanding your energy bill itself, not only the electricity bill, but your gas bill and how the demand charges work, the time of day, all those elements, because all those come in to the equation when you're trying to calculate the savings themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very helpful. So just to take this one step further, once I've done that, once I understand the current energy consumption, what are some of the different strategies that I can then use to really address the energy usage? So I always look to what my resources are. What are the resources at your disposal? So to start out, you have your suppliers. So people who sell you pumps, people who sell you oil, people who sell you O-rings, everything. So use your suppliers when you meet with them on a regular basis, ask them. What kind of opportunities for energy reducing products can I be looking into right now? So challenge that comfort zone that you might reach if everything's running correctly and ask, how much farther can I go with this? 
going back to other resources that I mentioned earlier, those state energy programs have consultants that are all engineers that are all in charge of helping people in different manufacturing settings find those opportunities for improvement. You know, talking to your power company, we've had one of my colleagues down in Illinois worked with one of his customers to use some of our energy efficient lubricants so that he can go back to his power company and negotiate a reduction in their rate. So just get creative with it and use your resources. Yes, good. That's tremendous advice. So let's get a little bit more specific and talk about lubricants. People probably don't make the connection between their oil and their energy usage. So how can lubricants help reduce energy consumption? Yeah, I'll take this one. So your lubricant spend in a maintenance type of budget is usually like 2 to 3%. So it's easy to overlook that as an area for opportunity in terms of how far it could influence that budget. So when you look at a two to three percent expense, that could actually impact up to six percent of your overall energy usage. Like that's something that's really screaming out to me opportunity. So how do lubricants actually reduce energy consumption? Usually when you're formulating an energy efficient lubricant, you want to find its performance landing kind of at the optimal point between volumetric and mechanical efficiency. So if I describe what those two things are, mechanical efficiency would be, for example, in a pump, the faster it runs, it's the most efficient, 100%. Volumetric means the more volume you can move, it's 100% efficient. So obviously, the more volume you're moving with a pump, the less you're going to turn as a pump. So you're going to be reducing a little bit of that mechanical efficiency. And to kind of paint that into a picture, I like using a Baywatch analogy. And basically it goes something like this. So, you know, and you're in Baywatch, you're running through the water. What is going to take more energy out of you? If you're running through water that's at your ankles or if you're running through water that's all the way up to your neck. So Mm -hmm. as you're running through water that's at your ankles, you're moving a lot faster, but you're not sloshing around as much volume, as much water. So you're a little bit cooler. But then if that volume of the water goes up, then you have to put a lot more energy and you're starting to feel a little bit hotter trying to run as fast as you can, but you certainly are sloshing around a lot more water. So you definitely want to find the right types of lubricants and the right type of balance formulation that's going to help you kind of be at the waist level, right? At the optimal point. And you get that as you get a little bit closer to like the more continuous size molecules. So sometimes people talk to you about synthetics and that's kind of what they're referring to there. Wow, I love that analogy. That's very colorful and very helpful. So now let's break it down to numbers because this is very important to companies and to plants. They want to talk metrics. So how can you actually validate your investment in energy efficient solutions? Well, there are different currencies at play. When we talk about currencies, we're talking about who are the stakeholders and what currencies do they understand? So for example, if we're talking a carbon footprint, A lot of people understand that area in terms of emissions, but by reducing the electricity, we also reduce the carbon footprint. So by doing so, it's a direct correlation in terms of kilowatt hours to CO2 emissions in kilograms or in tons. And these days throughout the world, the emissions side of it is becoming a commodity that's traded, especially in the cap and trade environment. There are a number of states, a number of provinces in Canada also that have gone to a cap and trade program and, and it's very rampant through the rest of the world. So that's something that is coming down the pipeline. But we also have other currencies, which is By being efficient and the machine being more efficient, we have increased throughput, we have better quality put through, and we also have better availability. All currencies that talk to production, to maintenance, and when we talk about reduction and money, well, all the financial guys just love that. So different ways of spelling that out in terms of the currencies themselves. Yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of different creative ways to show how it affects the bottom line. So Michelle, what could you add to that? Yeah, Michelle, you know, I think we are all really comfortable with the saying that nobody wants to be the first penguin in the water. So nobody (laughs) ever wants to be the first one taking the risk and having to put all the time and effort into validating this energy technology. So my best advice for that is don't recreate the wheel. Rely on credible sources that have already performed studies. Just to give you an example here in Wisconsin, we worked with the Focus on Energy program and this industry leading plastic injection molder their name is Evco Plastics. And essentially, we worked as a big team of engineers and ran an energy study 
that this program basically recorded and validated and said, hey, guys, you know, we're putting all the time and effort into doing this study, you know, X, Y or Z results came up there. So the other manufacturers in Wisconsin that have been interested in using some of the energy efficient product lines that we have have been looking at this specific study, understanding that it didn't just come from the supplier who's selling this oil, but it came from people who are credible sources out in the industry that collaborated on a project and put the resources into that project. So I would say, look at those studies, look at credible sources, and don't try to recreate the wheel because by the time that you're done trying to do the same experiment that somebody else did, your competition is probably already there saving money. Fantastic advice. (laughs) I'm really glad that you brought up some of the local and regional and statewide and national organizations, they're getting involved with energy efficiency and those buzzwords that we talk about like sustainability. So businesses aren't the only entities jumping on this energy efficiency bandwagon. It's also a major focus for governments. Can you guys describe for us how this represents a real opportunity for businesses? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the global perspective is totally scalable to that local perspective too. You're a small business or you're a big business in a local setting. Energy efficiency means more money in your pocket. If your pieces of equipment are operating a lot more crisply, a lot sharper, then that means you're reducing cycle time. That means you're a lot more competitive than you were a couple of months ago before you made your systems a lot more energy efficient. So I see it from a business perspective, not just hey, we're sustainable, hey, we're saving some money, but really our throughput capacities are increasing and we're able to service our customers in a way that our competitors can't. That's wonderful. I love that energy efficiency is not just a buzzword anymore. This is something that people are, businesses, governments, companies are all taking very, very seriously. And we could talk more about this, but of course, that's all the time we have today. I want to thank Michelle and Ken again for your wonderful insights. We really look forward to speaking with you all on future episodes of Maintenance Shop Talk, a podcast presented by Exxon Mobil. For more information on the topics discussed in today's episode, please be sure to visit mobile.com forward slash podcast. Thanks so much for joining us and please join us next time. 